moved in. <coughs> Today is 15th of February. This is the last day in the past before the beginning of the liturgical year. In the old days, a thousand years ago, the liturgical year began on September Jesus on Sunday. And this would be the final day of the year. And also, we uh, uh, Good to be here in Liverpool, the first visit here to Liverpool, and uh, you know, so that, uh, uh, and, and so it's good to be here in England, in Liverpool, and today a few considerations on St. Valentine, and on Our Lady, and uh, Pope Pius XII, and this crisis in which we find ourselves. So, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. We are in a great crisis in the church. And this crisis is many hundreds of years old as far as where we stand today. And it is a crisis that has now hit our little society of St. Pius X. But it isn't a new crisis. Like imagine that there was a, a, a fleet of ships like the Spanish Armada in 1588. And there came a great storm. And in this storm, we usually see one ship sink, and then another one sinks, and another one sinks. And uh, in this great storm, as the waves keep going back and forth, fewer and fewer ships, as the waves continue, survive the storm. And then finally, after many hundreds of other ships have sunk, now we find the water coming into our ship. And now we see that we thought we were in a watertight submarine, or the modern watertight ship. We thought we were in a ship like the Titanic. Most members of the Society of St. Pius X believe that the, the uh, Titanic was our ship. And that this, this, uh, this ship is a ship that not even God can sink. But in our case, we said it's a ship that the, maybe God can sink, but the devil certainly can. And we believe that our ship had such beautiful watertight containers. Watertight, uh, you know, the, those, the, the, in, in the Titanic, if you know in the sinking of the Titanic, there was watertight sealed, sealed compartments which made it possible for the Titanic, when it began to actually sink, it made two things possible in the sinking of the Titanic. One, it sat stably on the water for four hours. Whereas a normal ship that sinks, it lists. And when the ship lists, you're terrified because you can feel yourself ready to fall off the ship. The Titanic didn't list. But as the water is filled over one of the Titanic, because of those watertight compartments, it kept, the, it kept the, the water filling the ship, but without any of the normal signs of a water filling the ship because of the watertight compartments. But then once the water went over the wall, in four minutes and 30 seconds, it went under the waves. And so the captain of the ship knew exactly what was going to happen. He knew that the ship was sinking. He also knew that there were not a sufficient number of lifeboats <clears throat> to, uh, to house everyone on the ship, though there were enough lifeboats to save the vast, vast majority of those on the ship. He didn't want to offend anyone. They were only going to die. <laughs> and so therefore, he waited, and he did not command them to get into the lifeboats. When the time came to get into the lifeboats, many did not get. So there was a sinking of this ship, but there have been many waves. And the sinking of the Society of St. Pius X was very similar to the sinking of the Titanic. The water, the gash was made in the side of the ship by this great storm of the last 500 years, a long time ago. At least since Bishop Fillet became the superior in 1994. And the gash came into the ship, and water began to fill the ship. But on the top, it was stable. But in fact, the ship was sunk. Because there was a change, and it was an essential change, and not an accidental change. And it was not a new change. What had happened in the past, and what had happened to others, is now happening to the SSPX. What's the big change? We go to the example of St. Valentine. <clears throat> Valentine, this feast was yesterday, priest and martyr. 
The only one, for whatever reason, that it says in the entire missal, it says presbytera, presbytera et martyr. All the others, it simply says martyr. But for some reason, he is listed as priest and martyr. There are other priests who are martyred as well. But he's listed in our missal as priest and martyr. And Valentine, he lived in Rome, the city of Rome. And he was captured by the emperor, brought before the emperor. And the emperor said to him, why do you not worship our gods? And Valentine spoke to the emperor and he said, and if you don't worship our gods, you will be killed and thrown in prison and martyred. And he said, if you knew what you were speaking about, O emperor, you would not ask me to burn incense to your foolish gods. For there is only one God, and he is the true God, and he is the one that I serve. And he is the God that you must serve. And if you serve this God, you will be blessed in your kingdom. And if you serve the true God, you will have a happy kingdom. And you will be able to defeat all of your enemies. And God will bless you and give you the victory over all your enemies. And the emperor said, this priest, this man, Valentine, he's very wise. And he turned to his advisors and he said, listen to Valentine. He has very wise advice. And the priests, pagan priest advisors said, how can you listen to this man? We must follow the practice of our pagan fathers. We have always worshipped the gods. And how dare you listen to this man? And then the emperor became afraid. The emperor became afraid. He was the emperor. He could put those false priests to death, just like he could put Valentine to death. He could do anything he wanted, but it says in the life of Valentine, the emperor became afraid, and he lost courage. So Valentine had spoken to the emperor, and he was converting his soul. And the emperor lost courage. The emperor turned back to Valentine, and he said, you are saying foolish things. You must burn incense to the gods. He said, I will not burn incense to the gods. He said, I, he tortured him, put him in prison. And as Valentine was being brought to prison, he prayed to God. He said, Lord God, let everyone in this prison where I am going to be placed, let all those in my cell and let all those in the prison convert to the true religion and follow you. And Valentine went into the prison. And the provost came to him. And he saw the strength and happiness of Valentine. He says, why are you so happy? And how could you stand up like that against the emperor? And he said, but I know that you're a man of God. And I have a daughter. She is blind and she is deaf. If you can save my daughter, I will believe in your God. And so Valentine saved his daughter. And she, with her blindness and her deafness was taken away by the prayer of Valentine. And the provost and all the soldiers, they became Catholics. And they too would be martyred after Valentine. He was brought before the emperor again, and then he was tortured in various ways until he was finally beheaded. Valentine was one kind of Catholic. And we have another kind today. Valentine was threatened with death. And Valentine was stood in front of the emperor, and Valentine told the emperor, Do you want to have a happy kingdom? Do you want to rule forever? Do you want to have a, a rule that is going to be uh, permanent? Do you want to have victory against your enemies? Do you want to be blessed in your kingdom? Then serve the true God. Because Valentine was a judge of the king. And Valentine was a judge of all those around him because he was the ambassador of God. He was a priest of God. And he knew as a priest of God that wherever he was, he was to preach the word of God. And he knew as a priest of God, he was to strive to convert everyone. And who was he with? He was with his parishioners in the catacombs. So he tried to bring them to heaven. Then he was removed from his parishioners in the catacombs, and he was with guards and soldiers. And so he converted the guards and the soldiers and then he was brought before the emperor. And so he said, okay, now I'm in front of an emperor. Time to convert the emperor. What has happened? These are the priests of the church. Somewhere along the line, 
the devil has changed the priest. And it was through the scientific or Copernican revolution that he changed the priest. The priest is no longer the man of God wherever he is. He is only the man of God in church. He is no longer the man of God at all times. He is only the man of God on Sunday between 9 and 10.30. He is no longer the man of God in all places, which must be under the domain of Christ. He is the man of God in the spiritual place, the man of God in the spiritual time, the man of God when he is, when he is speaking of spiritual things. And as Bishop Williamson used to say many times, if there's anything I hate, it's spirituality. Because spirituality will get you to hell. You want to be a spiritualist? Go to fortune tellers. You want to follow the spirits? Read the read the for the funny papers and what your horoscope is today. We are not the followers of the spirits. We are not the leaders of the spirits. We are not about spirituality. We are about the God who made the temporal world, the God who made the stars, the God who made the sun, the God who made the earth, the God that made every man in it. The God that made everyone, including the little belly button of Buddha. And that belly button is in hell. Or that belly button, if he repented, will be found in heaven. But it is under the domain of God, no matter where that belly button is. He is the ruler of all things. And the one who is supposed to know that is the priest. When Valentine was thrown in prison... He said, all right, time to convert the prison. When Valentine was thrown before the emperor, all right, time to convert the emperor. Because I am the ambassador of the king who is the king of that emperor, the king of this place of Rome. One day this Rome will no longer be known as the great persecutor of the church. It will be known as the place, as the seat of our holy church. And that's what happened. We are in the Roman Catholic Church. And St. Valentine knew those things. But somewhere along the line, the priests forgot those things. And there was a great storm. And what was the storm? St. Augustine tells us what the storm is. When St. Peter got out of the boat to go to Christ, he was wise. The other eleven apostles were fools because they stayed in the safety of the boat. When Peter got out of the boat to go to Christ in the middle of a storm, he saw only Christ. He didn't think about walking on the waters. He only thought about Christ. And there was Christ. And these other 11 losers were in the boat. And Christ was outside the boat. What the heck were those guys? And he went to Christ. And after he had gone several hundred yards, maybe a hundred yards, he realized he was walking on water. And there was a storm. And the winds and the waves were quite impressive that day. And he looked back. And the boat was far away. He looked forward and Christ wasn't getting any closer. <clears throat> and so what did he do? The scripture tells us the sin of St. Peter, which is the sin of the priest. What is the great sin of the priests, of the bishops, and of the popes? Many popes, including Pius XII, down the last 500 years, with the exception of St. Pius V and St. Pius X. They took an accounting of the wind and the waves. That's the sin. The priest took an account of the wind and the waves. And St. Augustine says, what is the wind? The wind is false doctrine. The wind is error. The wind is heresy. The wind is all manner of lies. Who blows that wind? The father of lies. What is an effect of that wind? It stirs up the waves. And what are the waves? The wave is the wave of immorality. The wave of sin. The wave of immorality. And what was the problem of St. Peter and the problem of priests and the bishops and the popes of the last several hundred years? They did not deny Christ until recently. But they took an account of the wind and the waves. And this taking of account caused them to sink. 
In the old days, the church didn't take an account of the wind and the waves. When St. Valentine stood in front of the emperor, he didn't take account of the circumstances. Like remember the word of the very wise Wizard of Oz. When he was found by Dorothy at the end, and he describes, he paid no attention to the man behind the curtain, he said, how did you become the wizard? He said, well, I was in a balloon. And the balloon got blown away by the wind, and the wind carried me to this land, and they thought I was some kind of wizard. Times being what they were, I accepted the job. He adjusted to the circumstances. He accepted the job. He took an account of the situation. He took an account of the, of the, of the little people of Oz, and they decided he was a wizard. He said, well, if they want me to be a wizard, I might as well be a wizard. And the modern priests, and the modern bishops, and the modern popes take an account of the world so that Pope Francis can be man of the year in a gay magazine. Pope John Paul II, man of the year, several times. And they take an account of the winds, and they take an account of the waves. But these modern popes, they were not the first ones that took an account. It had happened before. The popes of the 19th century, for instance, they condemned the errors of modernism and its foundation. They condemned liberalism, but they were very afraid of the powers of the modern liberal Catholics of the 19th century, and therefore they did not condemn any of them. They did not remove any of them from semin as seminary professors. They did not take any action against the liberalism that they themselves condemned in encyclicals because they were afraid of what the world thought. They were afraid of the modern world. Peter could walk on water the great saint. So long as he looked at Christ, but well, once he took an account of the wind and the waves, he sank. And then there was a second mistake which the great saint Peter never made, we mentioned several times, but it's a mistake the modern Peters and the modern priests make. He sank, which was a foolish thing because he turned his eyes away from Christ. But now he has two options when he sinks. He sees the sinking, and he has two options. One option is, Andrew, throw out a life buoy. <laughs> send out a life buoy, throw out a rope, you know, send in the divers. That was one option. The other option is, Christ, save me. The great Saint Peter, who made the mistake of taking account of the wind and the waves, he did not turn back to Andrew. <laughs> He did not turn back to the boat. He didn't make the mistake twice. He turned to Christ and said, Lord, save me. And the Lord came over and picked him up. And he called for Andrew. He would have arrived too late. And Peter would have been buried in the water and drowned. Now what is happening in our times? Happening now in the society of St. Pius X. Happening 50 years ago in Pius XII. Pius XII was elected Pope, I mean, excuse me, was consecrated a bishop on May the 13th, 1917. He did not know anything about Fatima at that time, of course, but on that same day, the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to three children in Portugal, in Fatima. <clears throat> Later on, Pius XII learned about Fatima, and he believed in Fatima. And he discovered that Our Lady appeared on May the 13th, 1917, the same day that he was consecrated a bishop. And when he became Pope, he called himself, and he thought of himself as the Pope of Fatima, that he believed in Fatima, he knew that Fatima was from heaven. And it got the Blessed Virgin Mary, in order to make sure that he realized how blessed he was before her eyes, made sure that he was consecrated a bishop without any way of knowing, on the same day that she appeared to those children in Fatima. And in 1928, the Blessed Virgin Mary asked Sister Lucy, Now is the time to consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And Pius XI disobeyed. Well, now is the time to consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart. And they didn't obey. Now in 1939, he becomes Pope. 
And he knows the request of Our Lady. And in 1931, Our Lord Jesus Christ appeared to Blessed Sister Lucy and said, Why have do you tell the ministers that they have waited too long? Why have they waited so long? If they continue to delay, it's been three years at that point, if they continue to delay, they will receive the punishment of the King of France. It shall end badly for them. And so Pius XII, when World War II began, he wanted to consecrate Russia, but there was all kinds of pressure. And in 1942, instead of obeying the Blessed Virgin Mary, he did two things. He consecrated the human race to the Immaculate Heart, and not Russia, thus disobeying Mary. Then he created the feast of August the 22nd, the Feast of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, second class feast. And in the feast, we have the epistle. The epistle says, the familiar epistle that we often read for Our Lady, and it says these words, Qui audit me non confundator, who hears me shall not be confounded. And here we have a case where the Holy Father, who did not like modernism, who did not like liberalism, did not hear Mary. He said the words, Qui audit me non confundator, whoever hears me, they shall not be confounded. And the Blessed Virgin Mary told the pious XII, you must consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart. And he had enough knowledge in 1942 to see that the real evil in World War II was not Germany, but Russia. He saw the persecution of the church. He knew about the millions and millions of Ukrainians who had been slaughtered in the 1930s by Stalin. More than 30 million. He knew about the great evil of Russia. He had no doubts. And he knew the caress of the Blessed Virgin Mary. But there was so much pressure. Compare the pressure that he received to the pressure that Valentine received. There would have been many, many good priests, many, many good bishops back in 1942 who would have listened to the Holy Father and consecrated Russia to the Immaculate Heart. And it would have been the end of World War II. And it would have been a great conversion of Russia. And it would have been a great renewal of the Catholic Church. And a great saving of millions and millions and millions and millions of souls. But the Pope who did not like the devil, wanted to find another solution than the solution of heaven. And the Pope was afraid to take into and put into practice the request of the Holy Mother, which he knew to be the request of the Holy Mother. And he tried to find another way to fight the devil. And of course he failed. He failed. Because there is no other way. Now we find the same temptation that the Holy Fathers, the last eight Holy Fathers, have tried to find another way than the way of Mary. And they have all failed. And what has happened? It has trickled down to the bishops. It has trickled down to the priests. It has trickled <clears throat> down to the faithful. So that we are all cowards. We are in an age of cowards. Our Father is a coward who will not listen to heaven. Because he takes an account of the wind and the waves. And so now the bishops are cowards. And then the priests are cowards. And now the faithful are also cowards. We are an age of cowards. We must be brought back an age of faith. Heaven's request is our demand. And we cannot play games with heaven. And we cannot mix and be balanced. You will not find balance amongst any of the saints. A man who tries to be balanced and walks a tightrope, one day he falls off. We are not men of balance. We are soldiers of Christ. And we charge into the battle when he says charge. We walk on the water when he says walk on the water. We go up against the whole universe that is fighting us if he says go up against the whole universe. We imitate Simeon Maccabeus. We imitate Judas Maccabeus. We imitate Elias the prophet. We imitate St. John the Apostle and St. Peter and all of the great saints who stood with Christ, stood with the truth, heard the words of heaven and listened to heaven. It 
is a very grave crisis that we are in. The crisis of taking an account of the winds and the waves. That's the crisis of the priesthood. And what are we doing now? Bishop Filet has decided to take an account of the wind and the waves. That he still wants to stop the storm. He still wants to survive the storm. But we have to be prudent. It's okay to try walking on water when you're in shallow water and it's a calm day. But in a storm at night, it's a, in the middle of the sea, it's a bad idea. But St. Peter didn't know it was a bad idea. He only knew that Christ was there and Christ came in a storm and Christ came in the middle of the night and Christ came when the winds were blowing and therefore that was the time to walk on the sea. And St. Galantine stood in front of the emperor. And what did he say? The truth in a clear and unequivocal way. And how does the Catholic Church in the last hundred years show an account of the wind and the waves by not being too severe? by not being too judgmental against the modern world and the modern errors and the modern heresies such as evolution and the foolishness of Galileo and the foolishness of Charles Darwin and the foolishness of, the, of Einstein the foolishness of, these, of Freud why are we not condemning these men that are causing millions of souls to go to hell by turning them away from God why are we not speaking against the errors of our time why are we not saying clearly what is the word of God and what is the truth of God? It is the only answer. And Valentine stood and said the truth to the emperor. And the emperor became a coward. And the emperor did not convert. But because he said the truth to the emperor, the provost converted. Because he said the truth to the emperor, all the soldiers in the prison converted. And his fellow prisoners converted. Had he not said the truth to the emperor, he would not have had the power to convert the provost. And this we do not understand. We cannot take an account of the foolishness of the modern world. We cannot compromise. This is what's happening all around us. There cannot be compromise. We cannot find language that is mixed. We cannot find something that has multiple interpretations. We must say clearly, the new mass is illegitimate and straight from hell. Any questions? And when the bishop says it is legitimately promulgated, he must be condemned. Period. Doesn't matter how many smiles he has and how nice his cassock is. If he says the new mass is legitimate, he lies. He speaks against God. It is a lie and it must be condemned. And if he says that, the, that Vatican II must be understood in the light of tradition, he lies. Because you don't understand hell in the light of heaven. You don't believe the Satan in the light of heaven. Satan, let me hear what you have to say. Now, I'm only going to listen to the part that's right. What do you do with Satan? You cast him back into hell. You say, be gone, Satan. You do not say, Satan, let's discuss things. Maybe you can convert. Eve tried to convert Satan. It went bad for women. It went bad for them because Eve tried to convert Satan. Adam tried to convert Eve. It has been the death of men for years. You cannot argue with a woman and a woman cannot argue with a devil. It only ends in death. We must. There are times when argument is useless. We must speak the truth and speak it clearly because we believe in that truth and we take an account of the Christ who walks in the night in the storm and we don't take an account of the wind we don't take an account of the darkness we don't take an account of the waves and this is the duty of the priest where is he supposed to go? wherever the sinners are St. Jerome used to say I am a priest send me a sinner Send me a sinner. What can I do with a saint? I can't absolve him because he's too holy. I can't teach him because he knows everything. So St. Jerome said, what can I do? I don't know what to do. I'm a priest. Send me saints. I don't know what to do. Send me sinners and I know what to do. The priest goes where sinners are. The priest goes where the darkness is. 
The priest goes where the waves are. The priest goes where the storm is. The priest goes where the wind is. And he is not bent by the wind. He doesn't care about the waves. And he doesn't care about the night. Because he carries a light inside of him. Which is the light of Jesus Christ. The light that says in the resurrection morning and the exultant, it is a light that shines in the night and is greater than the day star. That is the light that we carry. We hold that light in our hands, the holy sacrifice of the Mass. It is the light that enlightens the darkness. That's what St. John said. And the darkness does not comprehend it. But what do we do? Too bad. We don't care if it doesn't comprehend it. We will still show the light. We will still speak according to the light. And we will not take an account of the winds and the waves. This sin was a sin before the modern popes. It is worse now. It creates cowards. What's the answer to our crisis? Faith. Faith. The substance of things to be hoped for. The vision of things that appear not. We know that when Christ says He created Adam on the sixth day, which was six days after the first day, check your math, <laughs> not 600 billion years, they change the numbers every day, <laughs> that He created Adam on the sixth day. We know that He created light on the first day, but He didn't get around to creating the sun until the fourth day. And there's another kind of light than the light that comes from the sun. Moderns don't know that because they've never turned on a light bulb before. There is a light. It doesn't come from the sun. So surely there could be no light without the sun. So think modern idiots. They will burn in hell. And the number of fools in hell is infinite. We do not follow the way of fools. We follow God. And we know that everything he taught is true. <clears throat> And that our salvation depends upon the believing of what he taught. And in this fight now, we cannot have any half-hearted warriors. We're past all that. Who once half and half can never succeed in this battle. We accept all of Christ's teaching. Everything in the sacred scripture. Everything in the divine tradition. We accept it all. And we take all of it as a hammer. And she, we use it against the devil. And it is our strength. Do not take an account of the wisdom of fools, which are the modern professors and the modern universities, and these modern idiots who got PhDs and SOBs and everything else behind their name. We don't follow that. Stand for the truth. And we pray that we each have this great faith without which it is impossible to please God. That's what we need now. And the faith must be in Our Lady. That's the place of faith right now. In the greatest fight of Good Friday, who was the one that was able to be next to Christ? Though he was a fool, though he was a coward, though he was weak, just like the other apostles. But he was able to be there because he stood next to the Blessed Virgin Mary. He was St. John. He didn't know what was happening. He didn't know Christ would rise from the dead. He didn't know that it was a victory. He thought he was being defeated. But he knew enough to stand next to Mary. That's enough. Stand next to the Holy Father while she is at the foot of the cross standing. And we're safe. Stand next to her and she will give us the strength. She will teach us whatever we need to learn in order to be faithful to that divine son as we watch him bleeding in the mystical body. We must stand next to him. Stand next to her. And then we will learn not to take account of the winds and the waves. And we will be like Valentine and the other great saints who when they were in prison thought of bringing Christ to prison. When they were in front of a pagan judge they thought of bringing Christ to the pagan judge and everywhere they were, they were ambassadors of the kingdom of Christ. And we must also be ambassadors of his true kingdom. And he will bless us. And he will give the victory. And all we have to do is make sure that we are always on his side. And always on the side of his holy mother. Because that's the side of truth. That's the side of divine love. And that's the side of victory. So as I go bless you all from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.